The Long Rain, Part 2, Policy, Progeny, and Pain. The shame that Lucamore the Lusty visited on the Kingsguard and the Crown was not the only difficulty Jaehaerys and Alysanne faced in 73 AC. Let us pause now for a moment and consider the vexing question of their seventh and eighth-born children, Prince Vagon and Princess Dahlia. Queen Alysanne took great pride in arranging marriages, and had put together hundreds of fruitful unions for lords and ladies from one end of the realm to the other. But never before had she faced so much difficulty as she did whilst searching for mates for her four younger children. The struggle would torment her for years, bringing about no end of conflict between her and the children her daughters in particular, drive her and the king apart, and in the end, bring her so much grief and pain that for a time, her grace contemplated renouncing her marriage to spend the rest of her life with the Silent Sisters. The frustration started with Vagon and Dahlia. Only a year apart in age, the prince and princess seemed well matched as babes, and the king and queen assumed that the two of them would eventually marry. Their older siblings, Balon and Alyssa, had become inseparable, and plans were already being made for them to wed. Why not Vagon and Dahlia as well? Be sweet to your little sister, King Jaehaerys told the prince when he was five. One day, she will be your Alysanne. As the children grew, however, it became apparent that the two of them were not ideally suited. There was no warmth between them, as the queen saw plainly. Vagon tolerated his sister's presence, but never sought it out. Dahlia seemed frightened of her sour, bookish brother, who would sooner read than play. The prince thought the princess stupid. She thought him mean. They are only children, Jaehaerys said when Alysanne brought the problem to his attention. They will warm to one another in time. They never did. If anything, their mutual dislike only deepened. The matter came to a head in 73 AC. Prince Vagon was ten years old, and Princess Dahlia, nine, when one of the Queen's companions, new to the Red Keep, teasingly asked the two of them when they would be married. Vagon reacted as if he had been slapped. I would never marry her, the boy said in front of half the court. She can barely read. She should find some lord in need of stupid children, for that's the only sort he will ever have of her. Princess Dahlia, as might be expected, burst into tears and fled the hall with her mother, the queen, rushing after her. It fell to her sister, Alyssa, at thirteen, three years Vagon's elder, to pour a flagon of wine over his head. Even that did not make the prince repent. You are wasting arbor gold, was all he said before stalking from the hall to change his clothing. Plainly, the king and queen concluded afterwards some other bride must needs be found for Vagon. Briefly, they considered their younger daughters, Princess Saria was six years old in 73 AC, Princess Viscera only two. Vagon has never looked twice at either one of them, Alysanne told the king. I am not sure he is aware that they exist. Perhaps if some maester wrote about them in a book. I shall tell Grand Maester Elisar to commence tomorrow, the king japed. Then he said, He is only ten. He does not see girls, no more than they see him. But that will soon change. He is comely enough, and a prince of Westeros, the third in line to the Iron Throne. In a few more years, maidens will be fluttering around him like butterflies and blushing if he dines to look their way. The queen was unconvinced. Comely was perhaps too generous of a word for Prince Vagon, who had the silver-gold hair and purple eyes of the Targaryens, but was long of face and round of shoulder, even at ten, with a pinched sour cast to his mouth that made men suspect he had recently been sucking on a lemon. As his mother, her grace was mayhaps blind to these flaws, but not to his nature. I fear for any butterfly that comes fluttering around Vagon. He is like to squash it flat beneath a book. He spends too much time in the library, Jaehaerys said. Let me speak to Balon. We will get him out into the yard, put a sword in his hand and a shield on his arm. That will set him right. Grandmaster Elisar tells me that his grace did indeed speak to Prince Balon, who dutifully took his brother under his wing, marched him out into the yard, put a sword into his hand, and a shield upon his arm. It did not set him right. Vagon hated it. He was a miserable fighter, and he had a gift for making everyone around him miserable as well. 
even Balon the Brave. Balon persisted for a year, at the king's insistence. The more he drills, the worse he looks, the spring prince confessed. One day, mayhaps in an attempt to spur Vagon into making more of an effort, he brought his sister, Alyssa, to the yard, shining in man's mail. The princess had not forgotten the incident of the arbor gold. Laughing and shouting mockery, she danced around her little brother and humiliated him half a hundred times, whilst Princess Dahlia looked down from a window. Shamed beyond endurance, Vagon threw down his sword and ran from the yard, never to return. We shall return to Prince Vagon in due course, but let us turn now to a joyful event. In 73 AC, King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne were blessed again by the gods when Prince Aemon's wife, the Lady Jocelyn, presented them with their first grandchild. Prince Rhaenys was born on the seventh day of the seventh moon of the year, which the Septims judged to be highly auspicious. Large and fierce, she had the black hair of her Baratheon mother and the pale violet eyes of her Targaryen father. As the firstborn child of the Prince of Dragonstone, many hailed her as next in line for the Iron Throne after her father. When Queen Alysanne held her in her arms for the first time, she was heard to call the little girl, quote, our queen to be. In breeding, as in so much else, Balon the Brave was not far behind his brother, Aemon. In 75 AC, the Red Keep was a site of another splendid wedding, as the Spring Prince took to bride the eldest of his sisters, Princess Alyssa. The bride was 15, the groom, 18. Unlike their father and mother, Balon and Alyssa did not wait to consummate their union. The betting that followed their wedding feast was the source of much ribald humor in the days that followed, for the young bride's sounds of pleasure could be heard all the way to Duskendale, men said. A shire maid might have been abashed by that, but Alyssa Targaryen was as bawdy a wench as any barmaid in King's Landing, and she herself was fond of boasting. I mounted him, and I took him for a ride, she declared the morning after the betting, and I mean to do the same tonight. I love to ride. Nor was her brave prince the only mount the princess would claim that year. Like her brothers before her, Alyssa Targaryen meant to be a dragon rider, and sooner rather than later. Aemon had flown at 17, Balon at 16, Alyssa meant to do it at 15. According to the tales set down by the dragon keepers, it was all that they could do to persuade her to not claim Balerion. He is old and slow, princess, they had to tell her. Surely you want a swifter mount. In the end, they prevailed, and Princess Alyssa ascended into the sky upon Meles, a splendid scarlet she-dragon, never before ridden. Red maidens, the two of us, the princess boasted, laughing, but now we've both been mounted. The princess was seldom long away from the dragon pit after that day. Flying was the second sweetest thing in the world, she would oft say, and the very sweetest thing could not be mentioned in the company of ladies. The dragon keepers had not been wrong. Meles was a swifter dragon as Westeros has ever seen, easily outpacing Seraxes and Vagar when she and her brothers flew together. Meanwhile, the problem of their brother Vagon persisted, to the queen's frustration. The king had not been entirely wrong about the butterflies. As the years passed and Vagon matured, young ladies at the court began to pay him some attention. Age and some uncomfortable discussions with his father and his brothers had taught the prince the rudiments of courtesy, and he did not squash any of the girls to the queen's relief. But he took no special notice of any of them either. Books remained his only passion. History, cartography, mathematics, languages. Grand Maester Elisar, never a slave to propriety, confessed to having given the prince a volume of erotic drawings, thinking, mayhaps, that pictures of naked maidens comporting with men and beasts and one another might kindle Vagon's interests in the charms of women. The prince kept the book, but showed no change in behavior. It was on Prince Vagon's 15th name day in 78 AC, a year short of his manhood, that Jaehaerys and Alysanne broached the obvious solution to the Grand Maester. Do you think that, mayhaps, Vagon might have the makings of a maester? No, Elisar replied bluntly. Can you see him instructing some lord's children how to read and write and do simple sums? Does he keep a raven in his chamber, or any sort of bird? Can you imagine him removing a man's crushed leg, or delivering a baby? All of these are required of maesters. 
The Grand Maester paused, then said, Vagon is no maester, but he could well have the makings of an archmaester in him. The Citadel is the greatest repository of knowledge in the known world. Send him there. Mayhaps he will find himself in the library. That, or he'll get so lost amongst the books that you never need concern yourselves with him again. His words struck home. Three days later, King Jaehaerys summoned Prince Vagon to his solar to tell him that he would be taking ship for Old Town in a fortnight. The Citadel will take good charge of you, his grace said. It is for you to determine what becomes of you. The prince responded curtly, as was his wont. Yes, father. Good. Afterwards, Jaehaerys told the queen that he thought Vagon almost smiled. Prince Balon had not ceased smiling since his marriage. When not aloft, Balon and Alyssa spent every hour together, most oft in their bedchamber. Prince Balon was a lusty lad, for those same shrieks of pleasure that had echoed through the halls of the Red Keep on the night of their bedding were heard many another night in the years that followed, and, soon enough, the much-hoped-for result appeared, and Alyssa Targaryen grew great with child. In 77 AC, she gave her brave prince a son they named Viserys. Septim Barth described the boy as, A plump and pleasant lad who laughed more than any babe I've ever known, and nursed so lustily, he drank his wet nurse dry. Against all advice, his mother clapped the boy in swaddling clothes, strapped him to her chest, and took him aloft on Maylees when he was nine days old. Afterward, she claimed Viserys giggled the whole time. Bearing and delivering a child may be a joy for a young woman of ten and seven, like the Princess Alyssa, but it is quite another matter for one of forty, like her mother, Queen Alysanne. The joy was therefore not entirely unalloyed when her grace was found to be pregnant once again. Prince Valerian was born in 77 AC, after another troubled labor that saw Alysanne confined to her bed for half a year. Like her brother, Gaiman, four years earlier, he was a small and sickly babe, and never thrived. Half a dozen wet nurses came and went to no avail. In 78 AC, Valerian died, a fortnight short of his first name day. The queen took his passing with resignation. I am 42 years old, she told the king. You must be content with the children I have given you. I am more suited to be a grandmother than a mother now, I fear. King Jaehaerys did not share her certainty. Our mother, Queen Alyssa, was forty-six when she gave birth to Jocelyn, he pointed out to Grand Maester Elisar. The gods may not be done with us. He was not wrong. The very next year, the Grand Maester informed Queen Alysanne that she was once more with child, to her surprise and dismay. Princess Gale was born in 80 AC, when the queen was forty-four, called the Winter Child, for the season of her birth, and because the queen was in the winter of her childbearing years, some said. She was small, pale, and frail, but Grand Maester Elisar was determined that she would not suffer the fate of her brothers, Gaiman and Valerian, nor did she. Assisted by Septa Lyra, who watched over the babe night and day, Elisar nursed the princess through a difficult first year, until finally it seemed as if she might survive. When she reached her first name day, still healthy, if not strong, Queen Alysanne thanked the gods. She was thankful as well that year to finally have arranged a marriage for her eighth-born child, Princess Dahlia. With Vagon settled, Dahlia had been next in line, but the tearful princess presented an entirely different sort of problem. My little flower, was how the queen described her. Like Alysanne herself, Dahlia was small, on her toes, she stood five foot two inches, and there was a childish aspect to her that led everyone who met her to think she was younger than her age. Unlike Alysanne, she was delicate as well, in ways the queen had never been. Her mother had been fearless. Dahlia always seemed to be afraid. She had a kitten that she loved, until he scratched her. Then, she would not go near a cat. The dragons terrified her, even Silverwing. The mildest scolding would reduce her to tears. Once, in the halls of the Red Keep, Dahlia had encountered a prince from the Summer Isles in his feathered cloak, and squealed in terror. 
His black skin had made her take him for a demon. Cruel, though her brother's Vagon's words had been, there was some truth to them. Dahlia was not clever. Even her Septa had to admit that. She learned to read after a fashion, but haltingly, and without full comprehension. She could not seem to commit even the simplest prayers to memory. She had a sweet voice, but was afraid to sing. She always got the words wrong. She loved flowers, but was frightened of gardens. A bee had almost stung her once. Jaehaerys, even more than Alysanne, despaired of her. She will not even speak to a boy. How is she to marry? We could entrust her to the faith, but she does not know her prayers, and her Septa says that she cries when asked to read aloud from the seven-pointed star. The queen always rose to her defense. Dahlia is a sweet and kind and gentle child. She has such a tender heart. Give me time. I will find a lord to cherish her. Not every Targaryen needs to wield a sword and ride a dragon. In the years that followed her first flowering, Dahlia Targaryen drew the eye of many a young lordling, as expected. She was a king's daughter, and maidenhood had only made her prettier. Her mother was at work as well, arranging matters in every way she could to place suitable marriage prospects before the princess. At thirteen, Dahlia was sent to Driftmark to meet Corlys Valerian, the grandson to the Lord of the Tides. Ten years her elder, the future Sea Snake was already a celebrated mariner and captain of ships. Dahlia became seasick crossing the Blackwater Bay, however, and on her return, complained that he likes his boats better than he likes me. She was not wrong in that. At fourteen, she kept company with Dennis Swan, Simon Staunton, Gerald Templeton, and Ellard Crane, all promising squires of her own age, but Staunton tried to make her drink wine, and Crane kissed her on the lips without her leave, reducing her to tears. By year's end, Dahlia had decided she hated all of them. At fifteen, her mother took her across the Riverlands to Raventree, in a wheelhouse, as Dahlia was afraid of horses where Lord Blackwood entertained Queen Alysanne lavishly, whilst his son paid court to the princess. Tall, graceful, courtly, and well-spoken, Royce Blackwood was a gifted bowman, a fine swordsman, and a singer who melted Dahlia's heart with ballads of his own composition. For a short while, it seemed as if a betrothal might be in the offing, and Queen Alysanne and Lord Blackwood even began to discuss wedding plans. It all fell to pieces when Dahlia learned that the Blackwoods kept the old gods, and she would be expected to say her vows before a weirwood. They don't believe in the gods, she told her mother, horrified. I'd go to hell. Her sixteenth name day was fast approaching, and with it, her womanhood. Queen Alysanne was at her wit's end, and the king had lost his patience. On the first day of the eightieth year since Aegon's conquest, he told the queen he wanted Dahlia wed before the year's end. If she wants, I can find a hundred men and line them up before her naked, and she can pick the one that she likes. He said, I would sooner she wed a lord, but if she prefers a hedge knight, or a merchant, or pate the pig boy, I am past the point of caring, so long as she picks someone. A hundred naked men would frighten her, Alysanne said, unamused. A hundred naked ducks would frighten her. The king replied. And if she will not wed? The queen asked. Magell says the faith will not want a girl who cannot read her prayers. There are still the silent sisters, said Jaehaerys. Must it come to that? Find her someone, someone gentle as she is, a kind man who will never raise his voice or his hand to her, who will speak to her sweetly and tell her she is precious and protect her against dragons and horses and bees and kittens and boys with boils and whatever else it is she fears. I shall do my best, your grace, Queen Alysanne promised. In the end, it did not require a hundred men, naked or clothed. The queen explained the king's command to Dahlia gently but firmly, and offered the choice of three suitors, each of whom was eager for her hand. Pate the pig boy was not amongst them, it should be said. The three men that Alysanne had selected were great lords or sons of great lords. Whichever man she married, Dahlia would have wealth and position. Boromund Baratheon was the most imposing of the candidates. At eight and twenty, the Lord of Storm's End was the image of his father, brawny and powerful, with a booming laugh 
a great black beard, and a mane of thick black hair. As the son of Lord Rogar by Queen Alyssa, he stood half-brother to Alysanne and Jaehaerys, and Dahlia knew and loved his sister, Jocelyn, from her years at court, which was thought to be much in his favor. Sir Tymon Lannister was the wealthiest contender, heir to Casterly Rock and all its gold. At twenty, he was nearer to Dahlia's own age, and thought to be one of the handsomest men in all the realm. Lithe and slender, with long golden mustachios and hair of the same hue, always clad in silk and satin. The princess would be well protected in Casterly Rock. There was no castle more impregnable in all Westeros. Weight against Lannister Gold and Lannister Beauty, however, was Sir Tymon's own reputation. He was overly fond of women, it was said, and even more fond of wine. Last of the three, and least in many eyes, was Roderick Arryn, Lord of the Eyrie and Protector of the Vale. He had been a lord since the age of ten, a point in his favor, for the past twenty years he had served on the small council as Lord Justicar and Master of Laws, during which time he had become a familiar figure about the court, and a leal friend to both king and queen. In the Vale, he had been an able lord, strong but just, affable, open-handed, loved by the small folk and his lord's bannermen alike. In addition, he had acquitted himself well in King's Landing. Sensible, knowledgeable, good-humored, he was regarded as a great asset to the council. Lord Aaron was the oldest of the three contenders, however. At six and thirty, he was twenty years older than the princess, and a father besides, with four children, left him by his late first wife. Short and balding, with a kettle belly, Aaron was not the man most maidens dream of, Queen Alysanne admitted. But he is the sort you asked for, a kind and gentle man, and he says that he has loved our little girl for years. I know he will protect her. To the astonishment of every woman at court, save mayhaps the queen, Princess Dahlia chose Lord Roderick to be her husband. He seems good and wise, like father, she told Queen Alysanne. And he has four children. I'm to be their new mother. What her grace thought of that outburst is not to be recorded. Grandmaster Elisar's account of the days says only, Gods be good. Theirs would not be a long betrothal. As the king had wished, Princess Dahlia and Lord Roderick were wed before the year's end. It was a small ceremony in the sept at Dragonstone, attended only by close friends and kin. Larger crowds made the princess desperately uncomfortable, nor was there a bedding. Oh, I could not bear that. I should die of shame. The princess told her husband-to-be, and Lord Roderick had acceded to her wishes. Afterward, Lord Aaron took his princess back to the Eyrie. My children will need to meet with their new mother, and I want to show the veil to Dahlia. Life is slower there, and quieter. She will like that, I swear to you. Your grace, she will be safe and happy. And so she was, for a time. The eldest of Lord Roderick's four children, from his first wife, was a daughter, Ellis, three years older than the new stepmother. The two of them clashed from the first. Dahlia doted on the three younger children, however, and they seemed to adore her in turn. Lord Roderick, true to his word, was a kind and caring husband who never failed to pamper and protect the bride he called My Precious Princess. Such letters as Dahlia sent her mother, letters largely written for her by Lord Roderick's younger daughter, Amanda, spoke glowingly of how happy she was, how beautiful the veil, how much she loved her lord's sweet sons, how everyone in the Eyrie was so kind to her. Prince Aemon reached his 26th name day in 81 AC, and had proved himself more than able in both war and peace. As the heir apparent to the Iron Throne, it was felt more desirable that he take a greater role in the governance of the realm as a member of the King's Council. Accordingly, King Jaehaerys named the Prince his Justicar and Master of Laws in place of Roderick Arryn. I will leave making the laws to you, brother, Prince Balon declared, whilst drinking to Prince Aemon's appointment. I would sooner make sons. And that was just what he did. For later that same year, Princess Alyssa bore her spring prince a second son, who was given the name Daemon. His mother, irrepressible as ever, took the babe into the sky on Melis within a fortnight of his birth, just as she had done with his brother, Viserys. In the Vale, however, his sister, Dahlia, was not doing near as well. 
After a year and a half of marriage, a different sort of message arrived at the Red Keep by Raven. It was very short, and written in Dahlia's own uncertain hand. I am with child, it said. Mother, please come. I am frightened. Queen Alisane was frightened too. Once she read those words, she mounted Silverwing within days and flew swiftly to the Vale, alighted first in Gulltown before proceeding on the gates of the moon, and then skyward to the Eyrie. It was 82 AC, and her grace arrived three moons before Dahlia was due to give birth. Though the princess professed delight that her mother had come and apologized for sending her such a silly letter, her fear was palpable. She burst into tears for the slightest reason, and sometimes for no reason at all, Lord Roderick said. His daughter, Alice, was dismissive, telling her grace, You would think she was the first woman ever to have a baby. But Alisane was concerned. Dahlia was so delicate, and she was carrying very heavy. She is too small a girl for such a big belly, she wrote the king. I would be frightened too if I were her. Queen Alisane stayed beside the princess for the rest of her confinement, sitting by her bedside, reading her to sleep at night, and comforting her fears. It will be fine, she told her daughter, half a hundred times. She will be a girl. Wait and see. A daughter. I know it. Everything will be fine. She was half right. Ama Aaron, the daughter of Lord Roderick, and Princess Dahlia, came into the world a fortnight early, after a long and troubled labor. It hurts, the princess screamed through half the night. It hurts so much. But it is said she smiled when her daughter was laid against her breath. Everything was far from fine, however. Childbed fever set in soon after birth. Though Princess Dahlia desperately wished to nurse her child, she had no milk, and a wet nurse was sent for. As her fever rose, the maester decreed that she might not even hold her babe, which set the princess to weeping. She wept until she fell asleep, but in her sleep she kicked wildly and tossed and turned, her fever rising higher and higher. By morning, she was gone. She was eighteen years of age. Lord Roderick wept as well, and begged the Queen's permission to bury his precious princess in the Vale, but Alisane refused. She was the blood of the dragon, she will be burned, and her ashes interred on Dragonstone, besides her sister, Daenerys. Dahlia's death tore the heart out of the Queen, but as we look back, it was plain to see that it was also the first hint of the rift that would open between her and the King. The gods hold us all in their hands, and life and death are theirs to give and take away. But men in their pride look for others to blame. Alisane Targaryen, in her grief, blamed herself and Lord Aaron and the Eyrie's maester for their parts in her daughter's demise. But most of all, she blamed Jaehaerys. If he had not insisted that Dahlia wed, that she pick someone before year's end, what harm would it have been for her to stay a little girl for another year, or two, or ten? She was not old enough or strong enough to bear a child, she told his grace back at King's Landing. We ought never have pushed her into marriage. It is not recorded how the king replied. The 83rd year after Aegon's conquest is remembered as the year of the Fourth Dornish War, better known amongst the small folk as Prince Morian's Madness, or the War of the Hundred Candles. The old Prince of Dorne had died, and his son, Morian Martell, had succeeded him in Sunspear. A rash and foolish young man, Prince Morian had long bristled at his father's cowardice during Lord Rogar's war. When Knights of the Seven Kingdoms had marched into the Red Mountains unmolested, whilst the Dornish armies stayed at home and left the Vulture King to his fate. Determined to avenge this stain on Dornish honor, the prince planned his own invasion of the Seven Kingdoms. Though he knew Dorne could not hope to prevail against the might that the Iron Throne could muster against him, Prince Morian thought that he might take King Jaehaerys unawares and conquer the Stormlands as far as Storm's End, or at the very least, Cape Wrath. Rather than attack by way of Prince's Pass, he planned to come by sea. He would assemble his hosts at Ghost Hill and the Tor, load them on ships, and sail them across the Sea of Dorne to take the Stormlanders by surprise. If he was defeated or driven back, so be it. But before he went, 
he swore to burn down a hundred towns and raise a hundred castles, so the Stormlanders might know that they could never again march into the Red Mountains with impunity. The madness of this plan can be seen in the fact that there are neither a hundred towns, nor a hundred castles on Cape Wrath, nor even a third that number. Dorne had not boasted any strength at sea since Nymira burned her ten thousand ships, but Prince Morian did have gold, and he found willing allies in the pirates of the Septstones, the Selsails of Mir, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast. Though it took him the better part of a year, eventually, ships came straggling in, and the prince and his spearmen were loaded aboard. Dorian had been weaned on tales of Dornish glory, and like many young Dornish lords, he had seen the sun-modeled bones of the dragon Meraxes at the Hellholt. Every ship in his fleet was therefore manned with crossbowmen and equipped with massive scorpions of the sort that had felled Meraxes. If the Targaryens dared to send dragons against him, he would fill the air with bolts and kill them all. The folly of Prince Morian's plans cannot be overstated. His hopes of taking the Iron Throne unawares were laughable for a start. Not only did Jaehaerys have spies in Morian's own court, and friends amongst the shrewder Dornish lords, but the pirates of the Stepstones, the Selsails of Mir, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast are none of them famed for their discretion. A few coins changed hands, and that was all it took. By the time Morian set sail, the king had known of his attack for half a year. Boromund Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End, had been made aware as well, and was awaiting on Cape Wrath to give the Dornishmen a red welcome when they came ashore. He would never have the chance. Jaehaerys Targaryen and his sons, Aemon and Balon, had been waiting as well, and as Morian's fleets beat its way across the Sea of Dorne, the dragons Vermithor, Seraxes, and Vagar fell on them from out of the clouds. Shouts rang out, and the Dornish filled the air with scorpion bolts, but firing at a dragon is one thing, and killing it is quite another. A few bolts glanced off the scales of the dragons, and one punched through Vagar's wing, but none of them found any vulnerable spots, as the dragons swooped and banked and loosed great blasts of fire. One by one, the ships went up in gouts of flame. They were still burning when the sun went down, like a hundred candles floating on the sea. Burned bodies would wash up on the shores of Cape Wrath for half a year, but not a single living Dornishman set foot upon the Stormlands. The Fourth Dornish War was fought and won in a single day. The Pirates of the Stepstones, the Selsails of Mir, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast became less troublesome for a time, and Mara Martell became the Princess of Dorne. Back in King's Landing, King Jaehaerys and his sons received a riotous welcome. Even Aegon the Conqueror had never won a war without losing a man. Prince Balon had another cause for celebration as well. His wife Alyssa was again with child. This time, he told his brother Aemon, he was praying for a girl. Princess Alyssa was brought to bed again in 84 AC. After a long and difficult labor, she gave Prince Balon a third son, a boy they named Egon after the Conqueror. They call me Balon the Brave, the prince told his wife at her bedside. But you are far braver than me. I would sooner fight a dozen battles than do what you've just done. Alyssa laughed at him. You were made for battles, and I was made for this. Viserys, and Daemon, and Egon, that's three. As soon as I'm well, let's make another. I want to give you twenty sons, an army of your own. It was not to be. Alyssa Targaryen had a warrior's heart and a woman's body, and her strength failed her. She never fully recovered from Egon's birth, and died within the year at only four and twenty. Nor did Prince Egon long survive her. He perished half a year later, still shy of his first name day. Though shattered by his loss, Balon took solace in the two strong sons that she had left him, Viserys and Daemon, and never ceased to honor the memory of his sweet lady with the broken nose and mismatched eyes. And now I fear we must turn our attention to one of the more troubling and distasteful chapters in the long reign of King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne. The matter of their ninth-born child, Princess Saria, Born in 67 AC, three years after Dahlia, Saria had all the courage that her sister lacked, along with a voracious hunger for milk, for food, for affection, for praise. 
As a babe, she did not so much cry as scream, and her ear-piercing wails became the terror of every maid in the Red Keep. She wants what she wants, and she wants it now, Grandmaster Ellisor wrote, of the princess in 69 AC, when she was only two. Seven save us all when she is older. The dragon keepers had best lock up the dragons. He had no notion of how prophetic those words would be. Septembarth was more reflective, as he observed the princess at the age of twelve in 79 AC. She is the king's daughter, and well aware of it. Servants see to her every need. Though not always as quickly as she might like, great lords and handsome knights show her every courtesy. The ladies of the court defer to her. Girls of her own age vie with one another to be her friends. All of this, Saria takes as her due. If she were the king's firstborn, or better still, his only child, she would be well content. Instead, she finds herself the ninthborn, with six living siblings who are older than her and even more adored. Amon is to be king. Balon most like will be his hand. Alyssa may be all her mother is, and more. Vagon is more learned than she is. Majel is holier. And Dahlia. When does a day go by when she is not in need of comfort? And while she is being soothed, Saria is being ignored. Such a fierce little thing she is, they say. She has no need of comfort. They are wrong in that, I fear. All men need comfort. Arya Targaryen had once been thought to be wild and willful, given to acts of disobedience. But Princess Saria's girlhood made Arya seem a model of decorum by comparison. The border between innocent pranks, wanton mischief, and acts of malice is not always discerned by one so young, but there can be no doubt that the princess crossed it freely. She was forever sneaking cats into her sister Dahlia's bedchamber, knowing that she was frightened of them. Once she filled Dahlia's chamber pot with bees. She slipped into White Sword Tower when she was ten, stole all the white cloaks she could find, and dyed them pink. At seven, she learned when and how to steal into the kitchens to make off with cakes and pies and other treats. Before she was eleven, she was stealing wine and ale instead. By twelve, she was like as not to arrive drunk when summoned to the Sept for prayer. The king's half-witted fool, Tom Turnip, was the victim of many of her japes and her unwitting cat's paw for others. Once, before a great feast, where many lords and ladies were to be in attendance, she persuaded Tom that it would be much funnier if he performed naked. It was not well received. Later, far more cruelly, she told him that if he climbed the Iron Throne he could be king, but the fool was clumsy at the best of times and prone to tremors, and the throne sliced his arms and legs to pieces. She is an evil child, her septa said of her afterwards. Princess Saria had half a dozen septas and as many bedmaids before she turned thirteen. This is not to say that the princess was without her virtues. Her maesters affirm that she was very clever, as bright as her brother Vagon in her own way. She was certainly pretty, taller than her sister Dahlia, and not half so delicate, and as strong and as quick and spirited as her sister Alyssa. When she wanted to be charming, it was hard to resist her. Her big brothers, Amon and Balon, never failed to be amused by her mischief, though they never knew the worst of it. And long before she was half-grown, Saria had learned the art of getting anything she wanted from her father. A kitten, a hound, a pony, a hawk, a horse. Jaehaerys did draw a firm line at an elephant. Queen Alysanne was far less gullible, however, and Septim Barth tells us that Saria's sisters all misliked her to various degrees. Maidenhood became her, and Saria truly came into her own after her first flowering. After all they had endured with Dahlia, the king and queen must have been relieved to see how eagerly Saria took to the young men of the court, and they to her. At fourteen, she told the king she meant to marry the Prince of Dorne, or perhaps the king beyond the wall, so she could be a queen, quote, like mother. That year, a trader from the Summer Islands came to court. Far from shrieking at the sight of him, as Dahlia had, Saria said she might like to marry him too. By fifteen, she put such idle fantasies beside. Why dream of distant monarchs when she could have as many squires, knights, and likely lords as she desired? Dozens danced attendance on her, but three soon emerged as her favorites. Jonah Mouton was the heir to Maidenpool. 
Red Roy Connington was the 15-year-old lord of Griffin's Roost, and Braxton Beesbury, called Stinger, was a 19-year-old knight, the finest lance in the Reach, and the heir to the Honeyholt. The princess had female favorites as well. Perry Ann Moore and Alice Turnbury, two maids of her own age, became her dearest friends. Saria called them Pretty Perry and Sweetberry. For more than a year, the three maids and the three young lords were inseparable at every feast and ball. They hunted and hawked together too, and once sailed across Blackwater Bay to Dragonstone. When the three lords rode at rings or crossed swords in the yard, the three maids were there to cheer them on. King Jaehaerys, who was forever entertaining visiting lords or envoys from across the narrow sea, sitting at council, or planning further roads, was well pleased. They would not need to scour the realm to find a match for Saria, when three such promising young men were here at hand. Queen Alysanne was less convinced. Saria is clever, but not wise, she told the king. Lady Perianne and Lady Alice were pretty, vapid, empty-headed little fools from what she had seen of them, whilst Connington and Mouton were callow boys. And I do not like this stinger. I've heard he sired a bastard in the Reach, and another here in King's Landing. Jaehaerys remained unconcerned. It is not as if Saria were ever alone with any of them. There were always people about, serving men and maids, grooms and men-at-arms. What mischief can they get up to with so many eyes around them? He did not like the answer when it came. One of Saria's japes was their undoing. On a warm spring night in 84 AC, shouts and screams from a brothel called the Blue Pearl drew notice of two men of the city watch. The screams were coming from Tom the Turnip, who was lurching helplessly in circles trying to escape from half a dozen naked whores, whilst the patrons of the house laughed uproariously and shouted on the harlots. Jonah Mouton, Red Roy Connington, and the Stinger Beesbury were amongst those patrons, each one drunker than the last. They had thought it would be funny to see Old Turnip do the deed, Red Roy admitted. Then Jonah Mouton laughed and said the jape had all been sorry as notion, and what a funny girl she was. The watchman rescued the hapless fool and escorted him back to the Red Keep, the three lords they brought before Sir Robert Redwine, their commander. Sir Robert delivered them to the king, ignoring Stinger's threats and Connington's clumsy attempt to bribe him. It is never pleasant to lance a boil, Grandmaster Elisar wrote of the affair. You never know how much pus will come out, or how badly it will smell. The pus that burst forth from the Blue Pearl would smell very badly indeed. The three drunken lords had sobered somewhat by the time the king confronted them from atop the Iron Throne and put up a bold front. They confessed to making off with Tom Turnip and bringing him to the Blue Pearl. None of them said a word concerning Princess Saria. When His Grace ordered Mouton to repeat what he had said about the princess, he blushed and stammered and claimed the watchman had misheard. Jaehaerys finally ordered the three lordlings taken to the dungeons. Let them sleep in a black cell tonight. Mayhaps they'll tell a different tale come morning. It was Queen Alysanne, knowing how close Lady Perianne and Lady Alice had been to the three lords, who suggested they be questioned as well. Let me speak with them, Your Grace. If they see you up there, on the Iron Throne, glaring down at them, they will be so frightened, they will never say a word. The hour was late, and her guardsmen found both girls asleep, sharing a bed in Lady Perianne's chambers. The queen had them brought before her in her solar. Their three young lords were in the dungeon, she told the girls. If they did not wish to join them, they would tell the truth. It was all she needed to say. Strawberry and Pretty Perry stumbled over one another in their eagerness to confess. Before long, both of them were weeping and pleading for forgiveness. Queen Alysanne let them plead, never saying a word. She listened, as she had done before at a hundreds women's courts. Her grace knew how to listen. It was just a game at the start, Pretty Perry said. Saria was teaching Alice how to kiss, so I asked if she would teach me too. The boys train at fighting every morning. Why shouldn't we train at kissing? That's what girls are meant to do, isn't it? Alice Turnberry agreed. 
Kissing was sweet, she said, and one night we started kissing with our clothes off, and that was scary but exciting. We took turns pretending we were boys. We never meant to be wicked. We were only playing. Then Saria dared me to kiss a real boy, and I dared Perry to do the same, and both of us dared Saria. But she said she would do us one better. She would kiss a man grown, a knight. That's how it began with Roy and Jonah Stinger. Lady Perry Ann jumped back in then to say that afterwards, it was Stinger who did the training for all of them. He has two bastards, she whispered, one in the reach, and one right here on the Street of Silk. Her mother is a whore at the Blue Pearl. That was the only mention of the Blue Pearl. Neither of the trolls knew the slightest thing concerning poor Tom the Turnip, as irony would have it, Grandmaster Elisir would write afterwards. But they knew a great deal about certain other things, none of which had been their fault. Where were your scepters during all of this? The queen demanded when she had heard them out. Where were your maids and the lords? They would have been attended. Where were their grooms, their men-at-arms, the squires and serving men? Lady Perry Ann was confused by the question. We told them to wait without, she said, in the tone of one explaining that the sun rises in the east. They're servants. They do what you tell them. The ones who knew, they knew to keep quiet. Stinger said he'd have their tongues out if they talked, and Saria is smarter than the Septas. That was where Sweetberry broke down and began to sob and tear at her dressing gown. She was so sorry, she told the queen. She had never wanted to be bad. Stinger made her and Saria, said she was a craven, so she showed them. But now she was with child, and she did not know who the father was, and what was she to do? All you can do tonight is go to bed, Queen Alisane told her. On the morrow, we shall send a scepter to you, and you can make a confession of your sins. The mother will forgive you. My mother won't, said Alice Turnberry, but she went as she was told. Lady Perry Ann helped her sobbing friend back to her room. When the queen told him what she had learned, King Jaehaerys could scarce credit a word of it. Guards were sent forth, and a succession of squires, grooms, and maids were dragged before the Iron Throne for questioning. Many of them wound up in the dungeons with their masters, once their answers had been heard. Dawn had come by the time the last of them had been led away. Only then did the Queen and King send for Princess Saria. The Princess surely knew that something was amiss when the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard and the Commander of the City Watch appeared together to escort her to the throne room. It was never good when the king received you whilst seated on the Iron Throne. The Great Hall was almost empty when she was brought in. Only Grandmaster Elisar and Septim Barth had been summoned to bear witness. They spoke for the Citadel and the Starry Sept, and the king felt a need for their guidance. But there were things like to be said that day that his other lords need never know. It is oft said that the Red Keep has no secrets. That there are rats in the walls who hear everything and whisper in the ears of sleepers by night. Mayhap so. For when Princess Saria came before her father, she appeared to know all that had happened at the Blue Pearl, and be not the least abashed. I told them to do it, but I never thought they would, she said lightly. That must have been so funny, turn up dancing with the whores. Not for Tom, said the king from the Iron Throne. He is a fool. Princess Saria answered with a shrug. Fools are meant to be laughed at. Where is the harm in that? Turnip loves it when you laugh at him. It was a cruel jape, said Queen Alisane. But just now, there are other matters that concern me more. I have been speaking with your... ladies. Are you aware that Alice Turnberry is with child? It was only then that the princess came to realize that she was not there to answer for Tom Turnip, but for more shameful sins. For a moment, Saria was at a loss for words, but only for a moment. Then she gasped and said, My sweet Berry, truly, she... Oh, what has she done? Oh, my sweet little fool. If Septim Barth's testimony is to be believed, a tear rolled down her cheek. Her mother was not moved. You know perfectly well what she has done, what all of you have done. We will have the truth from you now, child. And when the princess looked to her father, she found no comfort there. Lie to us again, and it will go very much the worse for you, King Jaehaerys told his daughter. Your three lords are in the dungeons, you ought to know, and what you say next may determine where you sleep tonight. Saria crumbled then, and the words came tumbling out, one after another. In a rush, 
a flood that left the princess almost breathless. She went from denial to dismissal to quibbling to contrition to accusation to justification to defiance in the space of an hour, with stops at giggling and weeping along the way, Septembarth would write. She never did it. They were lying. It never happened. How could they believe that? It was just a game. It was just a jape. Who said that? That was not how it happened. Everyone likes kissing. She was sorry. Perry started it. It was such fun. No one was hurt. No one ever told her kissing was bad. Sweetberry had dared her. She was so ashamed. Balon used to kiss Alyssa all the time. Once she started, she did not know how to stop. She was afraid of the stinger. The mother above had forgiven her. All the girls were doing it. The first time she was drunk, she had never wanted to. It was what men wanted. Majel said the gods forgave all sins. Jonah said he loved her. The gods had made her pretty. It was not her fault. She would be good from now on. It will be as if it never happened. She would marry Red Roy Connington. They had to forgive her. She would never kiss a man again or do any of those other things. It wasn't her who was with child. She was their daughter. She was their little girl. She was a princess. If she were queen, she would do as she liked. Why wouldn't they believe her? They never loved her. She hated them. They could whip her if they wanted, but she would never be their slave. She took my breath away, this girl. There was never a mummer in all the land who gave such a performance, but by the end, she was exhausted and afraid, and her mask slipped. What have you done? The king said, when at last the princess ran out of words. Seven, save us, what have you done? Have you given one of these boys your maidenhead, tell me true? True, said Saria. It was in that moment, with that word, that the contempt came out. No, I gave it to all three. They all think they were the first. Boys are such silly fools. Jaehaerys was so horrified he could not speak, but the queen kept her composure. You are very proud of yourself, I see. A woman grown and nearly seven and ten. I am sure you think you have been very clever, but it is one thing to be clever and another to be wise. What do you imagine will happen now, Saria? I will be married, the princess said. Why shouldn't I be? You were married at my age. I shall be wedded and bedded. But to whom? Jonah and Roy both love me. I could take one of them, but they are both such boys. Stinger does not love me, but he makes me laugh and sometimes makes me scream. I could marry all three of them, why not? Why should I have just one husband? The Conqueror has two wives, and Magor had six or eight. She had gone too far. Jaehaerys rose to his feet and descended the Iron Throne, his face a mask of rage. You would compare yourself to Magor? Is that who you aspire to be? His grace had heard enough. Take her back to her bedchamber, he told his guards, and keep her there until I send for her again. When the princess heard his words, she rushed toward him, crying, Father! Father! But Jaehaerys turned his back on her, and Giles Morrigan caught her by the arm and wrenched her away. She would not go of her own accord, so the guards were forced to drag her from the hall, wailing and sobbing and calling for her father. Even then, Septim Barth tells us, Princess Saria might have been forgiven and restored to favor if she had done as she was told, if she had remained meekly in her chambers reflecting on her sins and praying for forgiveness. Jaehaerys and Alysanne met all the next day with Barth and Grandmaster Elisir discussing what was to be done with the six sinners particularly the princess. The king was angry and unyielding, for his shame was deeply felt, and he could not forget Saria's taunting words about his uncle's wives. She is no longer my daughter, he said more than once. Queen Alysanne could not find it in her heart to be so harsh, however. She is our daughter, she told the king. She must be punished, yes, but she is still a child, and where there is sin, there can be redemption. My lord, my love, you reconciled with the lords who fought for your uncle. You forgave the men who rode with Septim Moon. You reconciled with the Faith and Lord Rogar when he tried to tear us apart and put Arya on your throne. Surely you can find some way to reconcile with your own daughter. Her Grace's words were soft and gentle, and Jaehaerys was moved by them, Septim Barth tells us. 
Alisane was stubborn and persistent, as she had a way of bringing the king around to her own point of view, no matter how far apart they had been at the start. Given time, she might have softened his stance on Saria as well. She would not have that time. That very night, Princess Saria sealed her fate. Instead of remaining in her rooms as she had been instructed, she slipped away whilst visiting the privy, donned a washerwoman's robes, stole a horse from the stables, and escaped the castle. She got halfway across the city, to the Hill of Rainus, but as she tried to enter the Dragon Pit, she was found and taken by the Dragon Keepers and returned to the Red Keep. Alisane wept when she heard, for she knew her cause was hopeless. Jaehaerys was hard as stone. Saria with a dragon, was all he had to say. Would she have taken Beleriand as well, I wonder? This time, the princess was not allowed to return to her own chambers. She was confined to a tower cell instead, with Jonquil Dark guarding her day and night, even in the privy. Hasty marriages were arranged for her sisters in sin. Perry Ann Moore, who was not pregnant, was wed to Jonah Moonton. You played a part in her ruin. You can be a part of her redemption, the king told the young lordling. The marriage proved to be a success, and in time, the two became the Lord and Lady of Maidenpool. Alice Turnberry, who was pregnant, presented a harder case, as Red Roy Connington refused to marry her. I will not pretend Stinger's bastard is my son, nor make him the heir to Griffin's roost, he told the king, defiant. Instead, Strawberry was sent to the Vale to give birth, a girl, with bright red hair, at a mother house, on an island in Gulltown Harbor, where many lords sent their natural daughters to be raised. Afterwards, she was married to Dustin Pryor, the Lord of Pebble, an island off the fingers. Connington was given a choice between a lifetime in the Night's Watch or ten years of exile. Unsurprisingly, he chose exile and made his way across the narrow sea to Pentos and thence to Mir, where he fell in with sellswords and other low company. Only half a year before he might have returned to Westeros, he was stabbed to death by a whore in a Mirish gambling den. The harshest punishment was reserved for Braxton Beesbury, the proud young knight called Stinger. I could geld you and send you to the wall, Jaehaerys told him. That was how I served Sir Lucamore, and he was a better man than you. I could take your father's land and castle, but there would be no justice in that. He had no part in what you did, no more than your brothers did. We cannot have you spreading tales about my daughter, so we mean to take your tongue and your nose as well, I think, so you may not find the maids quite so easy to beguile. You are far too proud of your skill with sword and lance, so we will take that away from you as well. We shall break your arms and legs, and my maesters will make certain that they heal crookedly. You will live the rest of your life sorry as a cripple. Unless... Unless... Beesbury was as white as chalk. Is there a choice? Any knight accused of wrongdoing has a choice, the king reminded him. You can prove you're innocent at hazard of your body. Then I choose trial by combat, Stinger said. He was by all accounts an arrogant young man and sure of his skills at arm. He looked about at the seven kingsguards standing beneath the iron throne in their long white cloaks and shining scale and said, which of these old men do you mean for me to fight? This old man, announced Jaehaerys Targaryen, the one whose daughter you seduced and despoiled. They met the next morning at dawn. The heir to Honeyholt was 19 years of age, the king of 49, but still far from an old man. Beesbury armed himself with a morning star, thinking mayhaps that Jaehaerys would be less accustomed to defending himself against that weapon. The king bore blackfire. Both men were well-armored and carried shields. When the combat began, Stinger rushed hard at his grace, seeking to overwhelm him with the speed and strength of youth, making the spiked ball whirl and dance and sing. Jaehaerys took every blow on his shield, however, contenting himself with defense whilst the younger man wore himself out. Soon enough, the time arrived when Braxton Beesbury could scarce lift his arm, and then the king moved to the attack. Even the best of mail is hard-pressed to turn Valerian steel, and Jaehaerys knew where every weak point could be found. Stinger was bleeding from half a dozen wounds when he finally fell. Jaehaerys kicked his shattered shield away, opened the visor of his helm, laid Blackfire's point against his eye, and drove it deep. 
Queen Alisane did not attend the duel. She told the king she could not bear the thought that he might die. Princess Saria watched from the window of her cell. Jonquil Dark, her jailer, made certain that she did not turn away. A fortnight later, Jaehaerys and Alisane gave another of their daughters over to the faith. Princess Saria, who was not quite 17, departed King's Landing for Old Town, where her sister, Septa Magell, was to take charge of her instruction. She would be a novice, it was announced, with the Silent Sisters. Septim Barth, who knew the king's mind better than most, would later maintain the sentence was meant to be a lesson. No one could mistake Saria for her sister, Magell, least of all her father. She would never be a Septa, much less a Silent Sister, but she required punishment, and it was thought that a few years of silent prayer, harsh discipline, and contemplation would be good for her that it would set her on the path to redemption. That was not a path that Saria Targaryen cared to walk, however. The princess endured the silence, the cold baths, the scratchy rough-spun robes, the meatless meals. She submitted to having her head shaved and being scrubbed with horsehair brushes. And when she was disobedient, she submitted to the cane as well. All this she suffered for a year and a half, but... When her chance came, in 85 AC, she seized it, fleeing from the mother house in the dead of night and making her way down to the docks. When an older sister came upon her during her escape, she knocked the woman down a flight of steps and leapt over her to the door. When word of her flight reached King's Landing, it was assumed that Saria would be hiding somewhere in Old Town, but Lord Hightower's men combed the city door to door and no trace was found of her. It was then thought that, mayhaps, she would make her way back to the Red Keep to beg pardon from her father. When she did not appear there either, the king wondered if she might not flee to her former friends. So Jonah Moonson and his wife, Perry Ann, were told to keep watch for her at Maidenpool. The truth did not come out until a year later, when the former princess was seen in a Lycine pleasure garden, still clad as a novice. Queen Alisane wept to hear it. They have made our daughter into a whore, she said. She always was, the king replied. Jaehaerys Targaryen celebrated his 50th name day in 84 AC. The years had taken their toll on him, and those who knew him well said that he was never the same after his daughter Saria had disgraced and then abandoned him. He had grown thinner, almost gaunt, and there was more gray than gold in his beard now, and in his hair. For the first time, men were calling him the Old King rather than the Conciliator. Alisane, shaken by all the losses they had suffered, withdrew more and more from the governance of the realm and seldom came to council meetings any longer. But Jaehaerys still had his faithful Septim Barth and his sons. If there is ever another war, he told the two of them, it will be for you to fight. I have my roads to finish. He was better with roads than with daughters, Grandmaster Elisar would write later in his customary waspish style. In 86 AC, Queen Alisane announced the betrothal of her daughter, Visera, 15 years of age, to Theomor Manderley, the fierce old lord of White Harbor. The marriage would do much and more to tie the realm together by uniting one of the great houses of the north to the Iron Throne, the king declared. Lord Theomor had won great renown as a warrior in his youth, and had proved himself a canny lord under whose rule White Harbor had prospered greatly. Queen Alisane was very fond of him as well, remembering the warm welcome he had given her during her first visit to the north. His lordship had outlived four wives, however, and whilst still a doughty fighter, he had grown very stout, which did little to recommend him to Princess Viserra. She had a different man in mind. Even as a little girl, Viserra had been the most beautiful of the queen's daughters. Great lords, famous knights, and callow boys had danced attendance on her all her life, feeding her vanity until it became a raging fire. Her great delight in life was playing one boy off against the other, goading them into foolish quests and contests. To win her favor for a joust, she made admiring squires swim the Blackwater Rush, climb the Tower of the Hand, or set free all the ravens in the rookery. 
Once, she took six boys to the dragon pit and told them she would give her maidenhead to whoever put his head in a dragon's mouth. But the gods were good that day, and the dragon keepers put an end to that. No squire was ever going to win Viserra, Queen Alysanne knew. Not her heart, and certainly not her maidenhead. She was far too sly a child to go down the same path as her sister, Saria. She has no interest in kissing games, nor boys, the queen told Jaehaerys. She plays with them as she used to play with her puppies, but she would no more lie with one than with a dog. She aims much higher, Arvisera. I have seen the way she preens and prances around Balon. That is the husband she desires, and not for love of him. She wants to be queen. Prince Balon was 14 years older than Viserra, 29 to her 15, but older lords had married younger girls, as she knew well. It had been two years since Princess Alyssa had died, yet Balon had shown no interest in any other woman. He married one sister, why not another? Viserra told her closest friend, the empty-headed Beatrice Butterwell. I am much prettier than Alyssa ever was. You saw her. She had a broken nose. If the princess was intent on marrying her brother, the queen was equally determined to prevent it. Her answer was Lord Manderley and White Harbor. Theomore is a good man, Alysanne told her daughter. A wise man, with a kind heart and a good head on his shoulder. His people love him. The princess was not persuaded. If you like him so much, mother, you should marry him, she said, before running to her father to complain. Jaehaerys offered no solace. It is a good match, he told her, before explaining the importance of drawing the North closer to the Iron Throne. Marriages were the Queen's domain in any case, he said. He never interfered in such matters. Frustrated, Viserra next turned to her brother Balon in hopes of rescue if court gossip could be believed. Slipping past his guards into his bedchamber one night, she disrobed and waited for him, making free with the prince's wine whilst she lingered. When Prince Balon finally appeared, he found her drunk and naked in his bed and sent her on her way. The princess was so unsteady that she required the help of two maids and a knight of the king's guard to get her safely back to her own apartments. How the battle of wills between Queen Alysanne and her headstrong 15-year-old daughter might have finally resolved will never be known. Not long after the incident in Balon's bedchamber, as the queen was making arrangements for Viserra's departure from King's Landing, the princess traded clothes with one of her maids to escape the guards who had been assigned to keep her out of mischief, and slipped from the Red Keep for what she termed, quote, one last night of laughter before I go and freeze. Her companions were all men, two minor lordlings, and four young knights, all green as spring grass and eager for Viserra's favor. One of them had offered to show the princess parts of the city that she had never seen, the pot shops and rat pits of Flea Bottom, the inns along Eel Alley and River Row where the serving women danced on tables, the brothels of the Street of Silk, ale, mead, and wine all featured in the evening's frolics, and Viserra partook eagerly. At some point, near to midnight, the princess and her remaining companions, several of the knights having become insensible from drink, decided to race back to the castle. A wild ride through the streets of the city ensued, and the King's Landers scrambled out of the way to avoid being run down and trampled. Laughter rang throughout the night, and spirits were high until the racers reached the foot of Egon's high hill, where Viserra's palfrey collided with one of her companions. The knight's mare lost her footing and fell, breaking his leg beneath her. The princess was thrown from the saddle headfirst into a wall. Her neck was broken. It was the hour of the wolf, the darkest time of night, when it fell to Sir Ryan Redwine of the Kingsguard, to rouse the king and queen from their sleep, to tell them that their daughter had been found dead in an alley at the foot of Aegon's high hill. Despite their differences, the loss of Princess Viserra was devastating to the queen. In the space of five years, the gods had taken three of her daughters, Dahlia in 82 AC, Alyssa in 84 AC, Viserra in 87 AC. Prince Balon was greatly distraught as well, wondering if he should have spoken to his sister less brusquely the night he found her naked in his bed. 
Though he and Amon were a comfort to the king and queen in their time of grief, along with Amon's wife, the Lady Jocelyn, and their daughter, Rhaenys, it was to her own remaining daughters that Alysanne turned for solace. Majel, 25 years of age, and Acepta took leave from her sept to stay with her mother for the rest of that year, and Princess Jael, a sweet, shy child of seven, became the queen's constant shadow and support, even sharing her bed at night. The queen took strength from their presence, but even so, more and more, she found her thoughts turning to the daughters who were not with her. Though Jaehaerys had forbidden it, Alysanne defied his edict and secretly engaged agents to keep watch over her wayward child across the narrow sea. Saria was still in Lys. She knew from their reports, still, at the Pleasure Garden. Now twenty years of age, she oft entertained her admirers, still garbed as a novice of the faith. There were evidently a good many Lyseni who took pleasure in ravishing innocent young women who had taken the vows of chastity, even when the innocence was feigned. It was her grief over the loss of Princess Visera that finally drove the queen to approach Jaehaerys about Saria once again. She brought Septim Barth along with her to speak on the virtues of forgiveness and healing properties of time. Only when Barth had finished did her grace mention Saria's name. Please she begged the king. It is time to bring her home. She has been punished long enough, surely. She is our daughter. Jaehaerys would not be moved. She is a Lyseni whore, his grace replied. She opened her legs for half my court, threw an old woman down the steps, and tried to steal a dragon. What more do you require? Have you given any thought as to how she got passage to Liz? She has no coin. How do you think she paid for her passage? The queen cringed at the harshness of his words, but still she would not yield. If you will not bring Saria home for the love of her, bring her home for love of me. I need her. You need her as a Dornish man needs a pit viper, Jaehaerys said. I am sorry. King's Landing has sufficient whores. I do not wish to hear her name again. With those words, he rose to leave, but at the door, he halted and turned back. We have been together since we were children. I know you as well as you know me. Right now, you are thinking that you do not need my leave to bring her home. That you can take Silverwing and fly to Liz yourself. What would you do then? Visit her in her pleasure garden? Do you imagine she will fly into your arms and beg for forgiveness? She is more like to slap you in your face. And what will the Lysini do if you try and make off with one of their whores? She has value to them. How much do you think it costs to lay with a Targaryen princess? At best, they will demand a ransom for her. At worst, they may decide to keep you too. What will you do then? Shout for Silverwing to burn their city down? Would you have me send Amon and Balon with an army to see if they can prize her free? You want her, yes. I hear you. You need her. But she does not need you, or me, or Westeros. She is dead. Bury her. Queen Alysanne did not fly to Liz, but neither did she ever quite forgive the king for the words he spoke that day. Plans had been underway for some time for the two of them to make another progress the following year, returning to the Westerlands for the first time in twenty years. Shortly after their falling out, the queen informed Jaehaerys that he should go alone. She was going back to Dragonstone, alone, to grieve for their dead daughters. And so it was that Jaehaerys Targaryen flew to Casterly Rock and the other great seats of the West alone in 88 AC. This time, he even called on Fair Isle, for the despised Lord Franklin was safely in his grave. The king was gone far longer than he had originally intended. He had roadworks to inspect, and he found himself making unplanned stops at smaller towns and castles, delighting many a petty lord and landed knight. Prince Amon joined him at certain castles, Prince Balon at others, but neither could persuade him to return to the Red Keep. It has been too long since I have seen my kingdoms and listened to my people, his grace told them. King's Landing will do well enough in your hands and your mother's. When at last he had exhausted the hospitality of the Westermen, he did not return to King's Landing, but moved directly to the Reach flying Vermithor from Crack Hall to Old Oak to begin a second progress, even as the first was ending. 
By that time, the Queen's absence had been noted, and His Grace would oft find himself seated next to some lysome maid or handsome widow at feasts, or riding beside them when hawking or hunting, but he took no notice of any of them. At Bandalon, when Lord Blackbar's youngest daughter was so bold as to seat herself in his lap and attempt to feed him a grape, he brushed her aside and said, Forgive me, I have a queen, and no taste for paramours. For the entire year of 89 AC, the king remained on the move. At Highgarden, he was joined for a time by his granddaughter, Princess Rhaenys, who flew to his side on Melise, the Red Queen. Together, they visited the Shield Islands, where the king had never been before. Jaehaerys made a point of landing on all four shields. It was on Green Shield, in Lord Chester's Hall, that Princess Rhaenys told him of her plans to marry and receive the king's blessing. You could not have chosen a better man, he said. His journeys finally ended in Old Town, where he visited with his daughter, Septima Gel, was blessed by the High Septum, and feasted by the Conclave. They enjoyed a tourney staged in his honor by Lord Hightower. Sir Ryan Redwine, again, emerged as champion. The maesters of that time referred to the estrangement betwixt the king and queen as the Great Rift. The passage of time and a subsequent quarrel that was near as bitter gave it a new name, the First Quarrel. That is how it is known to this day. We shall speak of the Second Quarrel in good time. It was Septima Gel who bridged the rift. This is foolish, father, she said to him. Rhaenys is to be married next year, and it should be a great occasion. She will want all of us there, including both you and mother. Archmaesters call you the conciliator, I have heard. It is time that you conciliated. The scolding had the desired effect. A fortnight later, King Jaehaerys returned at last to King's Landing, and Queen Alysanne returned from her own self-imposed exile on Dragonstone. What words passed between them we can never know, but for a good while afterwards, they were once again as close as they had been before. In the 90th year after Egon's conquest, the king and queen shared one of their last good times together, as they celebrated the wedding of their eldest grandchild, Princess Rhaenys, to Corlys Valerian of Driftmark, Lord of the Tides. At 7 and 30, the Sea Snake was already hailed as the greatest seafarer Westeros had ever known, but with his nine great voyages behind him, he had come home to marry and make a family. Only you could have won me away from the sea. He told the princess, I came back from the ends of the earth for you. Rhaenys, at six and ten, was a fearless young beauty, and more than a match for her mariner. A dragon rider since the age of thirteen, she insisted upon arriving for the wedding on Melise, the Red Queen, the magnificent scarlet she-dragon that had once borne her aunt, Alyssa. We can go back to the ends of the earth together, she promised Lord Corliss, but I'll get there first, as I'll be flying. That was a good day, Queen Alysanne would say with a sad smile, through the years that remained to her. She was fifty-four that year, but sad to say, she did not have many good days left. It is not within the scope of this history to chronicle the endless wars, intrigues, and rivalries of the free cities of Essos, save when they impinge upon the fortunes of House Targaryen and the Seven Kingdoms. One such time occurred during the years 91 to 92 AC, during what is known as the Mirish Bloodbath. We shall not trouble you with details. Suffice it to say that in the city of Mir, two rival factions vied for supremacy. There were assassinations, riots, poisonings, rapes, hangings, tortures, and sea battles before one side emerged supreme. The losing faction, driven from the city, tried to establish themselves first upon the Sept Stones, only to be hounded from there as well, when the Archon of Tyrosh made common cause with a league of pirate kings. In their desperation, the Mirmen turned to the island of Tarth, where their landings took the Evanstar by surprise. In a short time, they had taken the entire eastern side of the island. By that time, the Mirish were little more than pirates themselves, a ragged band of rogues. Neither the king nor his council felt it would require much to drive them back into the sea. Prince Amon would lead the assault, it was decided. The Mere men did have some strength at sea, so the Sea Snake would first need to bring the Valerian fleet south to protect Lord Boromund as he crossed to Tarth with his Stormlanders to join the Evanstar's own levies. 
Their combined strength would be more than sufficient to retake all of Tarth from the Mirish pirates, and if there proved to be unexpected difficulties, Prince Amon would have Syraxes. He does love to burn, the prince said. Lord Corliss and his fleet set sail from Driftmark on the ninth day of the third moon of 92 AC. Prince Amon followed a few hours later after bidding farewell to Lady Jocelyn and their daughter, Rhaenys. The princess had just learned she was expecting, else she would have accompanied her sire on Maylees. It's a battle, the prince said. As if I would ever have permitted that. You have your own battle to fight. Lord Corliss will want a son, I am sure, and I would like a grandson. Those were the last words he would ever speak to his daughter. Syraxes swiftly outdistanced the sea snake and his fleet, dropping down out of the sky on Tarth. Lord Cameron, the Evanstar of Tarth, had fallen back into the spine of mountains that ran down the center of the island and established a camp in a hidden valley from which he could look down onto the mirish movements below. Prince Amon met him there, and the two made plans together whilst Syraxes devoured half a dozen goats. But the Evanstar's camp was not as hidden as he hoped, and the smoke from the dragon's fires drew the eyes of a pair of mirish scouts who were creeping through the heights unawares. One of them recognized the Evanstar as he strode through the camp at dusk, talking with Prince Amon. The men of Mir are indifferent sailors and feeble soldiers. Their weapons of choice are dirk, dagger, and crossbow, preferably poisoned. One of the Mirish scouts wound his crossbow now behind the rocks where he was hidden. Rising, he took aim on the Evanstar a hundred yards below and loosed a bolt. Dusk and distance made his aim less certain, and the bolt missed Lord Cameron and struck Prince Amon, standing at his side. The iron bolt punched through the prince's throat and out the back of his neck. The Prince of Dragonstone fell to his knees and grasped the crossbow bolt, as if to pull it from his throat, but his strength was gone. Amon Targaryen died, struggling to speak, drowned on his own blood. He was thirty-seven years old. How can my words tell of the grief that swept the Seven Kingdoms then, of the pain felt by King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne, of Lady Jocelyn's empty bed and bitter tears, and the way Princess Rhaenys wept to know that her father would never hold the child she was carrying? Far easier to speak of Prince Balon's wrath, and how he came down upon Tarth on Vagar, howling for vengeance. The Mira's ships burned as Prince Morian's ships had burned nine years earlier. And when the Evanstar and Lord Boromund descended on them from the mountains, they had nowhere to fly. They were cut down by the thousands and left to rot along the beaches. So every wave that washed ashore for days was tinged with pink. Balon the Brave played his part in the slaughter with Dark Sister in his hand. When he returned to King's Landing with his brother's corpse, the small folk lined the streets, screaming his name and hailing him as a hero. But it is said that when he saw his mother again, he fell into her arms and wept. I slew thousands of them, but I will not bring him back. And the queen stroked his hair and said, I know, I know. Seasons came and went in the years that followed. There were hot days and warm days and days when the salt wind blew bracing off the sea. There were fields of flowers in the spring, and bountiful harvests and golden autumn afternoons. All across the realm, the roads crept onward, and new bridges spanned old streams. The king took no pleasure in any of it, so far as men could tell. It is always winter now, he said to Septembarth one night, when he had drunk too much. Since Amon's death, he always drank a cup or three of honeyed wine at night to help him sleep. In 93 AC, Prince Balon's 16-year-old son, Viserys, entered the dragon pit and claimed Balerion. The old dragon had stopped growing at last, but he was sluggish and heavy and hard to rouse, and he struggled when Viserys urged him up into the air. The young prince flew thrice around the city before landing again. He intended to fly to Dragonstone, he told his father afterwards, but he did not think that the Black Dread had the strength for it. Less than a year later, Valerian was gone. The last living creature in all the world who saw Valeria in its glory, wrote Septembarth. 
Barth himself died four years later, in 98 AC. Grandmaster Elisar preceded him by half a year. Lord Redwine had died in 89 AC, his son, Sir Robert, soon thereafter. New men took their places, but Jaehaerys was truly the old king by then, and sometimes he would walk into the council chamber and think, Who are these men? Do I know them? His grace grieved for Prince Amon until the end of his days, but the old king never dreamed that Amon's death in 92 AC would be like the hellhorns of Valerian legend, bringing death and destruction down on all those who heard their sound. The last years of Alisane Targaryen were sad and lonely ones. In her youth, good Queen Alisane had loved her subjects, lords and commons alike. She had loved her woman's courts, listening, learning, and doing what she could to help make the realm a kinder place. She had seen more of the Seven Kingdoms than any queen before or since, slept in a hundred castles, charmed a hundred lords, made a hundred marriages. She had loved music, had loved to dance, had loved to read, and oh, how she had loved to fly. Silverwing had carried her to Old Town, to the Wall, and to a thousand places in between, and Alisane saw them all as few others ever would, looking down from above the clouds. All these loves were lost to her in the last decade of her life. My uncle Magor was cruel, Alisane was heard to say, but age is crueler. Worn out from childbirth, travel, and grief, she grew thin and frail after Amon's death. Climbing hills became a trial to her, and in 95 AC, she slipped and fell on the serpentine steps, breaking her hip. Thereafter, she walked with a cane. Her hearing began to fail as well. Music was lost to her, and when she tried to sit in council meetings with the king, she could no longer understand half of what was said. She was far too unsteady to fly. Silverwing last carried her into the sky in 93 AC, when she came to Earth again and climbed painfully from her dragon's back. The queen wept. More than all of these, she had loved her children. No mother ever loved a child more, Grandmaster Benefier once told her, before the shivers carried him away. In the last days of her life, Queen Alisane reflected on his words. He was wrong, I think, she wrote, for surely... The mother above loved my children more. She took so many of them away from me. No mother should ever have to burn her child, the queen had said at the funeral pyre of her son, Valerian. But of the thirteen children she bore to King Jaehaerys, only three of them would survive her. Egon, Gaemon, and Valerian died as babes. The shivers took Daenerys at age of six. A crossbow slew Prince Aemon, Alyssa, and Dahlia died in childbed. Viscera, drunk in the street. Septimagel, that gentle soul, died in 96 AC, her arms and legs turned to stone by grayscale, for she had spent her last years nursing those afflicted with that horrible condition. Saddest of all was the loss of Princess Gale, the winter child, born in 80 AC when Queen Alisane was 44 and thought to be well past her childbearing years. A sweet-natured girl, but frail and somewhat simple-minded, she remained with the queen long after her other children had grown and gone. But in 99 AC, she vanished from court, and soon afterward, it was announced that she had died of summer fever. Only after both her parents were gone, did the true tale come out. Seduced and abandoned by a traveling singer, the princess had given birth to a stillborn son, then, overwhelmed by grief, walked into the waters of Blackwater Bay, and drowned. Some say that Alice never recovered from that loss, for her winter child alone had been a true companion during her declining years. Saria still lived, somewhere in Volantis. She had departed from Liz some years before, an infamous woman, but a wealthy one. But she was dead to Jaehaerys, and the letters Alice sent her, secretly from time to time, all went unanswered. Vagon was an archmaester at the Citadel. A cold and distant son, he had grown to be a cold and distant man. He wrote as a son ought. His words were dutiful, but there was no warmth to them, and it had been years since Alisane had last seen his face. Only Balon the Brave remained near her till the end. Her spring prince visited her as often as he could, and always won a smile from her. But Balon was the prince of Dragonstone, 
hand of the king, forever coming and going, sitting at his father's side at council, treating with the lords. You will be a great king, even greater than your father, Alisane told him the last time they were together. She did not know. How could she know? After the death of Princess Gale, King's Landing and the Red Keep became unbearable to Alisane. She could no longer serve as she once had, as a partner to the king in his labors, and the court was full of strangers, whose names Alisane could not quite recall. Seeking peace, she returned once more to Dragonstone, where she had spent the happiest days of her life with Jaehaerys. Between their first and second marriages, the old king would join her there when he could. How is it that I am the old king now, but you are still the good queen? He asked her once. Alisane laughed. I am old as well, but I am still younger than you. Alisane Targaryen died on Dragonstone on the first day of the seventh moon in 100 AC, a full century after Aegon's conquest. She was 64 years old. I think that one of you guys said it best in that this chapter really feels like an era coming to an end. We're seeing a lot of characters from the show born with Viserys being 16 at the end of this chapter. Although he's not talked about a ton, it's very evident that Jaehaerys is kind of at the end of his reign and his lifespan. Which feels kind of weird considering we've spent so much of the book with him up to this point. I know we didn't start with him, but I would say most of the chapters up to this point have been with Jaehaerys kind of taking the lead as the main character, so it's going to be interesting to see how that transition plays out moving forward uh, once Jaehaerys does finally pass and we get into the next generation of Targaryens. And I think one of the most interesting themes that's kind of touched on in this chapter is the idea that the Targaryens aren't anything special compared to a regular person. Alysanne, in the end, ended up having, I believe, 11 children, uh, with only two of them actually surviving. And I think that, combined with the more rebellious of the children, really just kind of hammers home the point that the Targaryens are, at the end of the day, just people. And I think this is kind of an interesting transition, especially considering what we know from the standard Game of Thrones show about how Robert's rebellion eventually takes the Targaryens out of power. So that's kind of some interesting theming that I was noticing. And I'm excited to see how that leads into Robert's rebellion down the road. I know we still have a long ways to go. And frankly, I'm not even sure if it's covered in this book. Uh, I am actually reading these chapters as I record them. So I don't have any knowledge about how the story is going until I have the chapters released. But the trend definitely seems to be some sort of degeneration of the Targaryen line as a whole. It'll be interesting for me to see how this plays out. I mean, if you've watched the House of the Dragon show, uh, you know that there is further infighting between the royal bloodline, especially seeing what happens with Viserys in the end of the show. But let me know what you guys think. How did you think the second half of this chapter played out? And also, how you feel now that we are getting really close to the part of the story where House of the Dragon is taking place in. Definitely leaving off on a much sadder note on this chapter. Not a super feel-good chapter, but definitely I think a necessary one in the overarching part of the storyline, and it's not like that's out of character as far as the Game of Thrones universe is concerned. Thank you guys, as always, so much for watching and I am looking forward to talking to you again in the next one.